final point is that there is a lot of good news here. First of all, I suppose there's good news just about the charter schools themselves. But as I said at the beginning, nothing that they're doing is illegal, right? It's not like it is illegal for your regular public schools to have a long school day if they think that might be important for helping kids from disadvantaged families. They can do it. It's perfectly legal. They can have a long school year. They can pay teachers in a different way. We have to try and learn from the charter schools more generally so that we're not faced with a world in which either all the kids go to charter schools or all the kids go to regular public schools, but rather all the kids go to schools that are succeeding, whether they're called regular public schools or charter schools, and that's going to mean adopting a set of policies that work. So thank you very much. I would be glad to answer questions at this point. And there we go back to the St. Louis Hall. bias in uh, the, the parents that try to get into the lottery even though they're, is there a possible selection bias the parents who apply for a lottery even if they fail compared to the parents who don't apply for a lottery? I think it's fair to say that parents who want to send their children to charter schools are a little different. Um, on the one hand, they're motivated enough to put in an application. Admittedly, it's a simple application, but still an application. On the other hand, they are disproportionately likely to have kids who are struggling in the regular public schools. So one of the most noticeable things is that if you look at the track record of a child whose parents are about to apply to a charter school, he is already doing quite badly in the regular public schools. Hardly anyone whose child is doing really well in the regular public schools decides, I want to send my child to a charter school. So I think they get a mixed bag. They get some more motivated families, but they also get a lot of families where their kids are already having problems. My understanding with charter schools, they're supposed to try to save money. How can you do that by paying some teachers more? And the second question is, uh, when schools are open longer days, uh, Saturdays and a longer school year, does the state compensate that school for more? Great question, because this has got to be in everybody's mind. Wait a minute, they get less money than the regular public schools, and they do all these extra things. How does this all add up, right? Um, uh, very important. Well, first of all, they don't get extra money from the state for having a long school year or a long school day. And they don't get different amounts of money for paying teacher salaries because they pay teachers differently. They don't. What they do is they essentially adopt a model where more of the money, the total amount of money that they get, is going into the classrooms and going to teacher salaries. They really, they're giving up other things. Okay, so they may have, um, they may have less in the way of special facilities, they may have things that are uh, lower on those grounds, but they, they push more money into, the, into teachers, teacher compensation, the things that they think matter the most. The long school day and the long school year uh, essentially are achieved by small increases in class size. Now that may not sound like it's very possible, but a 10% increase in class size, which is only about two students on average in the United States, gives you 10% more money, because basically that's the way it works. A 10% reduction in class size Costs you 10% more, 10% increase in class size saves you 10% more. So if I increase my class size by, say, three students, which is 15%, I now have 15% of my budget released, and I can dedicate that to extending the length of my school year, extending the length of my school day. And that is, those are the sorts of things they do. I'll tell you one other thing that I think is really clever <laughs> about charter schools, or some of them anyway, not all of them do this, but they've realized that teachers don't get a lot better after they've been teaching for, say, four years. We know now that teachers improve for their first couple of years of teaching, and then after year three or four, they're pretty much, they're teaching at whatever level they're going to be teaching at for the rest of their lives. Well, that means that there isn't a whole lot of point in paying your 20-year veterans three times as much as the people who are your four, you know, year four teachers. And charter schools have figured out, look, we don't have to keep teachers their whole lives. What we have to do is have a lot of young, active, energetic teachers who teach for several years, maybe not their entire <coughs> careers, and we need to have some teachers who are real veterans and act as mentors to the younger teachers. But they have a teaching model that, uh, if you're old enough, you will remember was more like the teaching model that we used to have in the United States. Lots of young, well, women, but also men, but mostly women. Lots of young women teaching for several years before going on to maybe having children or doing some other career, and then some veteran teachers. And that model actually is a model that saves you a lot of money while also allowing you to pay those teachers well. 
Um, yes, uh, it seemed that you touched a lot of this throughout the presentation that a lot of the benefit or the difference with charter schools is the length of the day in the school year. Uh, to me, that seems like it's really kind of harboring more of an after school program or an intervention program that you may see with daycare. And you said maybe one way that we can improve public schools by adopting uh, this system and have this uh, charter school to compare to uh, public school systems that have a after school program. Right. So I think it's less like a pure after school program because these are very integrated, right? So the kids are actually set up with people who know what their homework is, who make sure that they're doing the homework and so forth and so on. And they're getting, um, it, it isn't so much like it's an after school program that's a little unrelated to your school, but it is, they're not sitting there the whole time just learning math all afternoon. They are, they're doing their homework and they're doing some extracurriculars. Um, we, there are very few regular public schools that have been willing to accept this very long school day. In fact, it's very controversial. Massachusetts tried to do it with some schools that were failing and the governor faced a lot of opposition. And the long school year has also faced a lot of opposition. So we don't have a lot of regular public schools that practice these policies. But there's no reason why they can't. They can, it's just that right now it's, it's politically tough for them to do it. I think there is a lot to be said for your interpretation of this. This is that you're changing the whole way the family interacts with the school. The model works much better for low income families and for families where both parents are working because they don't have to worry about my child comes home from school at 2.30 in the afternoon and there's no one to cover childcare until I get home at 6.15 or something like that. I, the school has just made that problem disappear. And that means that a lot of other problems disappear with it. For instance, one of the big problems for inner city schools is that kids lose their textbooks, they have their textbooks stolen, somebody takes them from their backpacks when they're on their way home. Well, that means that it's hard to manage this textbook problem. But if your kids will stay after school and do most of their homework at school, there's no problem. So uh, it is a, it's a different model. I think it's a model that more regular public schools should consider. Let me repeat this question for anyone who couldn't hear because she wasn't mic'd. The question was how much of charter school funding comes from private donations as opposed to public taxpayer supported funds? Well, um, the answer is uh, uh, none of operating expenses. That's not legal in any state in the United States. So in all states of the United States, charter schools are not allowed to take money from private funders for operating expenses. However, they usually are allowed to take money from private foundations or charitable gifts or something else for capital expenses, which would be equipping your building, buying computers, uh, renting a building, things like that, uh, renovating a building. Um, the typical charter school in the United States only gets about 7% of its money from private sources, so it really does not come up at all to how much money they would otherwise have from the state. But there are exceptions. There are really exceptions. So there are charter schools in the United States that have really nice capital funding because they get it from private sources and they have connected well with donors. But it, for the, you know, there are, there are always exceptions. But the average charter school in the United States is really not getting that much money from private donations. But the more successful ones, they're good at attracting the money. Uh, Dr. Hoxby, you uh, mentioned that, uh, thank you, that in the uh, charters, the extended day and the extended year seem to be uh, associated with increased achievement. But it, the research I've seen shows that uh, in the regular public schools, it's less closely associated with better outcomes. Do you have a theory on why that is? Yes, I think it's because, one, the extended year in regular public schools is usually not used because a school has figured out what they're going to do with the extended year. It's because they're trying to fit more kids into a building over the course of the year. So for instance, in Los Angeles, they want to use the same school for two shifts. And the way they do that is they have sort of a morning shift and an afternoon shift. And so each one has an extended year, but they have a shorter day. So that's, that's quite common is they sort of, we're just trying to use the buildings more efficiently. Um, and I don't think that's really the same thing. Um, the extended day, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that when you look at most, first of all, there are very few regular public schools that really have an extended day. There are a lot that have an after school program. I think that you need to have your after school activities probably integrated into the rest of the school's curriculum. I'm not sure that just having kids go and do an extra extracurricular things after school has the same effect. Um, in addition, most of those things are not very randomly assigned. So I, don't, I really don't know what the effects are that they're having. Part of what we're trying to do in the US is move educational research 
towards really scientific methods. And as we do that, we sometimes get different answers to the same questions.